Our keynote speaker this morning has deep roots in the Central Valley. Five generations, starting with his grandparents, Kaspar and Sirun Hovanishin. He is a well-respected member and leader in the California Armenian American community, where he and his entire family have four generations been champions of Armenian causes everywhere, from the Central Valley, throughout the diaspora, and in the Republic of Armenia. Armen Hovanishin attended UC Berkeley, UCLA, UCLA School of Law, and has practiced law in California since 1987. He is the founder and currently serves as the chairman of the Armenian Bar Association and continues to work tirelessly on efforts to achieve full recognition of the Armenian genocide. Given his passion for the Armenian people and for justice, it is no surprise that his grandfather was a Gamavod, or a freedom fighter, in General Antranik's army. Please welcome my very good friend, Mr. Armin Hovanishin. Is the destruction of an entire nation quantifiable? Is the decimation of nearly all of its people measurable? Is what was lost and what was taken recoverable by any stretch of imagination or of our efforts? Can the declaration of a president, of our president, or the decision of a court of law ever make us whole? These would be welcome developments, of course, but they could not completely fix the problem. What would heal the open wound is for the Republic of Turkey to get off the dime of denial and face the terrible truth of the great crime and of its consequences. As I look among you, I see that we have gathered here today from virtually every segment of our community. We are here, as your t-shirts say, to remember and to demand. We're here to release the anger and the anguish in our hearts. We're here with one hand to close and clench our fists, and with the other open hand to welcome efforts of repair. On this, on this, the 100th anniversary of the Armenian apocalypse. The reality is that our nation's destruction has left none of us untouched. It has left none of us unscathed. It has not left none of us able to say that the blood that is flowing through your veins is the very same blood that stained desert earth, desert sand, and village earth 100 years ago, today, right now, on this day, at this hour. As we honor our fallen today, as the supervisor, as the mayor, as the congressman, as Mary Alice have said so eloquently, we should remember those who remain standing. We should give thanks to the early generations of Armenian Americans who made sacrifices for all of us, giving foundation to our families and to our country. Ordinary men and women, your grandparents and mine, who worked in the wire factories of Worcester, Massachusetts, in the rubber plants of Watertown, in the iron and steel mills of Granite City and Waukegan, Illinois, on the assembly lines in Detroit, Michigan, in the cement plants of Riverside, California, and especially in this valley, in the orchards and vineyards of Fowler, Fresno, Tulare, and Visalia. It is, ladies and gentlemen, it is that wounded but never say die generation that fortified our backbone, gave us our confidence, and allowed for our success today. And while many today see success as power and prestige, success back then, real success 
was measured by the obstacles overcome to keep the dream alive and available to our and their children. Speaking of children, two little girls who were to loom large in my life were born just three months and 300 miles apart in a world away from California. One in the historic Armenian Kestrik village and the other in the picturesque seaside town of Ordu. Soon enough, my grandmothers, as though to those two little girls, were to become strangers by circumstance and then friends in fate and future. On April 24, 1915, under this day's sky, Sirun, who had come to be known as Sarah, and whose family had immigrated to the San Joaquin Valley a few years before 1915, was busy skipping rope, jumping hopscotch, and picking up jacks with her girlfriends from Cherry Avenue Elementary School. She was to graduate from Tulare Union High School, marry a giant among Kaspar, and name her four sons, John, Ralph, Richard, and Vernon, into whom she cemented security, confidence, the United States of America, and the English language. She took the lead as easily in the Emblem Club and the PTA as she did in the Armenian Relief Society and in the kitchen at, of the Ladies Guild at Holy Trinity Church. Her sprawling ranch-style house on Butler Avenue, not too far from here, with its thick wood shingle roof, overlooked the Sunnyside Country Club, a place that for many years said Armenians verboten, not allowed. She drove up a white Cadillac with a soft and smooth velvet interior. And just maybe, just maybe Grandma Sirun muttered under her breath, damn the country club. And had Kaspa lived just a little longer, he just may have bought the whole Durham golf course itself. He wouldn't have played a round of golf, most probably, but that would show them. Now, the other little girl, the other little girl was Kunguhi, and despite her wry smile in the black and white photograph on the credenza, with pigtails in her hair and a tennis racket in her hands, bid goodbye to most of her family on that fateful day 100 years ago, right now. And although she survived the genocide. Hungui's smile was turned down that day once and forever. In the years and decades to come, in picture after picture, it was one visual dirge, one unmitigated lament after another. It was a funeral procession that lasted nearly all of my grandmother's 91 years. 50 years in this country, and she still spoke English in choppy sentences with misconjugated verb and mixed up tenses. But what she did speak with is with expressive and tearful eyes. She went to no schools in America. She made no friends here. She played no games. She bent her back. She swallowed her pride, and she went to work in Fresno's fields. She married the quiet strength of Vartitev and Nazik. The son she lost was to be, to be named Vorej. Vorej in Armenian means revenge. And maybe that boy had to die for his name to live in us. Kungui's small home on Low Avenue, a mile away from here, with its meager, decaying roof, was similar to the hundreds that Kaspar gathered. She never drove a car, and neither did Hovaki. As we mark the centennial of the Armenian genocide, I struggle to fully understand, like I said, what was lost, what was taken. Was it only the childhood of Kungui? Was it only the roots of Sirun? Were their sorrows and anguish that much different from one another at the end of the day? 
Were they not both disinherited and dispossessed of their destinies, displaced even from themselves? My grandmothers and yours shared a common fundamental characteristic. They faced the darkness and insisted on a future for their families. They took silent oaths to never give up, to say yes to life and to believe in the possibility of justice. With the stories of these two little girls and in my life and the stories of your families engraved in yours, we must see to it that the chronic pain and the effects of the genocide are not dehumanized, that they're not examined numerically, analytically, scientifically, and that their significance is never lost or forgotten. Only when it is personalized, only when you take the genocide home with you, will it be real enough to make a difference in the decisions you make. These memories of hardship and of our president's broken promises, not only this president's, a long line of presidents, they may test our hopes and try our conscience, but memory, ladies and gentlemen, is our sacred duty, not simply to remember, however, but to act. Let us tell the world not only how our people died, but how they lived, how they loved, how they dreamed, and how they hoped. Remember this, remember this, remember this. Remembrance without resolve is a hollow gesture, and awareness without action changes nothing. In conclusion, it's a simple truth. It's a simple truth that we are more than the genocide. But the trauma, the trauma of the genocide skews perspective. It blurs the horizon and renders the future a mirage. See, this is the purpose of genocide itself, to erase the people, to erase the nation in the mind of the people who remain, and to erase everything else from the identity of the rest of us. It's a disgusting truth, but this is what genocide is. Look around. Today, the genocide may be our single most commonly shared trait of group identity, particularly outside of Armenia. Even a look at those who we consider or who consider themselves Armenians quickly shows that it is entirely possible that neither language, location, vocation, cuisine, culture, religion, or even genetics links one Armenian to another in the same way that the genocide does. And this should disturb us. It should frighten us that we are left holding more hands in our trauma than in our dances, left shifting more pride in our protests than in our literature, left embracing one another more in commemoration than in our celebration. This should disturb us. We are not museum pieces. We are a living nation, surely with stories still to tell and epics yet to write. It is now time, ladies and gentlemen, for us to champion our progress, not only our perseverance. We must wake up tomorrow with a consciousness that is both rooted in the Armenian genocide and which rises above it as well, that insists that we Armenians forevermore define our identity not by what was done to us, but what, by what we do from this day forward. As we enter tonight and tomorrow, the second century after the genocide, we, I have to say, in all modesty, are poised and prepared to take care of ourselves. It may also be time for us not merely to seek shards of solace and recognition and splinters of victory in, in, in resolutions. While we appreciate everything that our country, the United States of America, and the world community have done, especially in the aftermath of the Armenian Genocide, 
maybe, just maybe, it's time that we don't pin all of our hopes on, on somebody else to make us whole. From now on, let our redemption begin and end with us. God bless the souls. God bless the souls of all those 100 years ago who gave their lives so that we would have ours. And God give us the strength and the wisdom to live and walk in the shadow of their sacrifice and spirit. Thank you.